Hello, friends and neighbors. This is Pastor Stephen Wall coming to you again from St. John, St. Peter Lutheran Church in Cleveland, Wisconsin. I hope you're having a good week. You're looking forward to a, a good Memorial Day weekend, three day weekend coming up. And I pray that uh, you have a blessed time, a refreshing time with family if, if you're spending time with family. We are just about ready to finish our series looking at the Augsburg Confession of 1530. We're going to finish Article 28. That's the last article. We'll have one more lesson because there is a concluding section. So we'll look at that uh, next time, but that should be our last lesson on the Augsburg Confession. So let's pick up where we left off in Article 28. This is about the, the authority of the bishops. Uh, including the Pope, who is the Bishop of Rome, the authority that they have in the church to establish traditions and customs. Uh, and the, the, the point of contention uh, early on in the article, remember, was to make sure we understand the distinction between church and state. Some, some people will say separation of church and state. I don't know if that's quite accurate, but we, we need to have a distinction between church and state because not, they're not always separate entirely. Uh, there are places where they overlap, of course, but we want to have a distinction between them. And so that's the first part of Article 28. And then we, we turned our attention to the traditions that the the bishops had made, the authorities of the church had put in place traditions that maybe by themselves weren't necessarily bad, except that they connected with those traditions the forgiveness of sins. And so they were creating laws that if you didn't follow what the church told you to do, you were told that you were sinning. And if you did do what the church told you to do, you were told that you were earning forgiveness. You were earning out your way out of purgatory uh, that much faster. You were earning grace from God by doing those things. And so the Lutheran confessors took issue with that, this work righteousness that was connected to the power of the bishops in establishing church customs and traditions. Now, traditions aren't bad. Traditions can be a good thing, but we don't want to make them into something that earns salvation for us. And that's the real uh, contention that the Lutheran confessors had. And so um, as we go on now in paragraph 55, we see how the Lutheran confessors recognize the value of some traditions. And the Lutherans, in general, tried to hold on to as many traditions as they could, but any traditions that, that were, were intertwined with work righteousness, those are the things that, that they sought to undo. So beginning at paragraph 55, as long as it does not offend others, churches may properly follow such customs in order to preserve love and peace. In this way, all things will be done in the churches in an orderly way and without any confusion. They should do this in such a way that no consciences will be burdened by thinking that obeying these customs is necessary for salvation. And no one will think that they are sinning when they do not observe them, yet do not offend others. For example, no one should say that a woman sins who goes out in public with her head uncovered, as long as she does not give offense by doing so. And this is a reference to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 11, where the Apostle Paul talks about head coverings, uh, but he's dealing with a specific culture where uh, the prostitutes w or, or women who were putting themselves out there would shave their heads. And, and to or, or go uncovered. They wouldn't cover their heads. And so there was a, there was a cultural connection there that um, by, by going with the head uncovered in that culture, they were basically saying uh, they were available. Married women uh, would go around like that, saying that they were available. And so Paul discourages that. But that's a customary thing. It's a custom that deals with a particular culture. And the Lutheran confessors are saying, we don't practice that. 
The Catholic Church doesn't practice that. Why? Because it's a custom that uh, in one culture is going to cause offense, but not in German culture, not in Roman or Italian culture. So going on. Paragraph 57, observing the Lord's Day, Easter, Pentecost, and other holy days and rituals are customs of this kind. For those people make a big mistake by claiming that the church by its authority has decreed that Christians must worship on Sunday rather than Sabbath day. For it was scripture that did away with the observance of the Sabbath day. The Bible teaches that since the gospel has now been revealed, none of the ceremonies of the law of Moses need to be followed. Yet, since a day did have to be chosen so that Christians would know when they should gather for worship, it seems that the Christians chose Sunday for this purpose. It seems that this day was chosen for another reason as well. It gives people an example of how to use their Christian freedom and shows them that it is not necessary to observe the Sabbath nor any other day in particular. So we are able to worship on Sunday or we can worship uh, on other days of the week. Many churches, especially during the summer, offer a midweek service for those who maybe work over the weekend or if you're out camping over the weekend, and we have Christian freedom to do that. Sunday is, I think, a valuable day because sometimes we talk about it as a little Easter. Every Sunday we are celebrating the resurrection of Jesus that happened on a Sunday. But we have Christian freedom to worship any day of the week. There are a great number of arguments about the changing of the law, the ceremonies of the new law, and the changing of the Sabbath day. All of these have arisen because of the false belief that the church must have some set of laws, like the Old Testament Levitical laws, and the false belief that Christ had commanded his apostles and bishops to invent new ceremonies that people must obey to be saved. These errors slipped into the church when it was not being taught clearly that righteousness comes by faith. Some people argue that worshiping on Sunday may not be a command of God, but it is like a command of God. Then they make laws about how much work can be done on these holy days. Such arguments only become traps for people's consciences. For although they try to change the traditions, yet this lessening cannot bring real improvement as long as the thought remains that they are necessary. This will be the case wherever the righteousness of faith and Christian liberty are not properly understood. The apostles commanded Christians not to eat meat with the blood still in it. Who obeys this command in our day? And yet the people who do not obey it are not sinning, for even the apostles themselves did not wish to burden people's consciences with such claims. To avoid causing offense, they banned for a time the eating of meat with the blood still in it. For this decree must always remind us what the purpose of the gospel is. Almost no church laws are kept exactly. Every day, many customs go out of use, even among those who are the most eager supporters of traditions. Nor can consciences be properly cared for unless these customs are changed in the following way. Church laws must, uh, may be obeyed if this is done without teaching that they are necessary. And consciences should not be harmed even when traditions change. But the bishops might easily get the people to obey these customs if they would not insist that they keep traditions which cannot be kept with a good conscience. They now demand the priests remain unmarried. We dealt with that in an earlier article. They let no one become a priest unless he first swears that he will not teach the pure doctrine of the gospel. The churches are not asking that the bishops should restore harmony while losing their honor. Nevertheless, it would be proper for good pastors to do just that. We ask only that they would do away with the unjust burdens that are new and have been brought in contrary to the customs of the Catholic, that is, the universal church. It may be that in the beginning there were understandable reasons for some of these laws, and yet They are not useful for the church today. It is also clear that some of these laws were adopted because of false ideas. Therefore, it would be proper that the popes, out of kindness, change these customs now, for such changes do not shake the unity of the church, for many human traditions have been changed over time, as the church laws themselves show. But if it is impossible to reduce these customs that cannot be obeyed without sinning, 
then we are bound to follow the apostolic rule of Acts 5, verse 29, which commands us to obey God rather than men. We must obey God rather than men. And so if church leaders are demanding, requiring some, uh, their worshipers, their members to do something and saying that this has to be done to earn salvation, we must obey God rather than men. Peter forbids bishops to be lords and to rule over the churches. It is not now our plan to take earthly power away from the bishops. We only ask this one thing, that they allow the gospel to be taught purely and that they do away with a few customs which cannot be obeyed without sinning. But if they do not allow this, they will have to decide how they will answer to God, for by their stubbornness they are creating a reason for the church to be divided. And so Article 28 comes to an end. And uh, just a, st- a strong reminder of Christian freedom that we have, that we live in this freedom because we've been set free from the law, that Jesus kept the law perfectly in our place. That's the gospel. Our sins are paid for. There's nothing we have to add to it to earn salvation from God. We simply receive that righteousness of Jesus Christ from him. We receive the forgiveness of of sins. And so we can live for him. We can glorify him in our lives. Not earning, not work righteousness, earning of salvation from God or grace from God, but simply wanting to serve and glorify him. Treasure your Christian freedom, dear friends. Honor God with your life and the way that you live. Until next time, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. to lead